Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? It is great to see all of you. If you're joining us here at the Stones Crossing campus, if you're joining us at Greenwood East or Banto or Franklin, Garfield Park, if you're joining us at Martinsville or Seymour, if you're joining us online, wherever you're joining us, whatever campus location, maybe it's a microsite, uh, we just want to say good morning to you. Can we give it up for all of our first time guests today? So excited that you're here. And of course, if you're not brand new and this is not your first time, welcome back. We are wrapping up a series today called Fix My. And what we've been talking about in this series is that, man, in life, things break. Things break in your finances. Things can break in your attitude. Things can break in a relationship. Things can break, you know, at work. We've been talking about these different areas. And what we said is that people that are doing well in life, they don't avoid these breaks. Like, like everybody, everybody experiences a breakdown or something breaks in their life. Life. But people who are doing well at life, they lean in and they try to fix the things that are breaking their life. They don't kick the can down the road. They don't deny that something is broken. They don't ignore something that's broken. They lean in and they try to fix it. And because they do that, things don't compound. Problems don't build up over time. And so they're able to handle life and do life well because they're fixing things when they break. And so today what I want to do is talk to you about something that, that we all struggle with from time to time, and that is a breakdown in our desires. Today I want to talk to you about fix my desires. Desires. What an interesting topic. I want to talk about what's going on inside of you and inside of me today as we wrap up this series. How many of you would agree that you have this problem? You want what you should not want. Anybody? All right. Got some honest people out there today. You want what you should not want. That is a problem. Many of you know Dallas Willard. I love Dallas Willard. I've read many of his books. I always talk about divine conspiracy or renovation of the heart or spirit of the disciplines. He's got some fantastic books on the spiritual life. When Dallas used to talk about the spiritual life, he would say that human beings have this problem. We need to learn not to want what we currently want. And we need to learn to want the things that we don't yet now want. In other words, he would say, there's a problem with your wanter. <laughs> there's an issue with the things that you're wanting. We're, we're, we don't want the right things. We want the wrong things in our life. And therefore, we need to learn to want the things that we currently don't want and stop wanting the things that we currently want. Many of us want food more than we should, right? You agree, yeah? I mean, we eat enough and we're satisfied and then we want more. We want different types of food that are unhealthy for us. Many of us want to spend more money than we actually make because we want the thing so badly. So we're willing to put money on a credit card because why? We want it. We want it. We want to be noticed. We want to be number one. We want to be the center of attention. We want to be the life of the party. We want the, the high that drugs can bring. We want the feeling of being intoxicated from alcohol. We want things that we should not want. We want our kids to be number one. We want our kids to do better than we did. We want to live vicariously through our children. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We want the wrong thing. Sometimes we even want the, the high or that comes from risky behavior. Have you ever done the research on, on people that die? They, they go out to Colorado and they stand on the, you know, the cliffs and they take selfies and they die. They, they trip and they fall and they die. Have you seen this? It's crazy. Now, now most of the people who die doing this are male because <laughs> dudes are just not that smart. And we really like the adrenaline that comes from getting on the edge of the, of the, of, you know, the Grand Canyon and, you know, snapping a picture and then we fall off. You know, these are dudes. These are dudes. They're not ladies. Ladies are much smarter. They're much wiser. We love the rush that comes from risky behavior. We want what we should not want. How many of you have ever heard of Alex Hamlin? Alex Hamlin. His name is Alex Hamlin. Maybe you've seen the, the Netflix documentary, Solo, Free Solo. You watch that? Woo, I watched that uh, last year, and I have to admit that after I was done watching that documentary, I had lost five pounds because I was sweating. 
I sweated through the whole documentary. Um, Alex, as a young man, 15, 16, he wanted to free solo uh, this, this enormous uh, you know, rock face called uh, El Capitan in Yosemite Park. And so for 10 years, he prepared for this. And uh, if you don't know what free soloing is, free soloing is rock climbing without a rope. <laughs> it's real smart. You have some chalk, you have some shoes, and you just start climbing up this, uh, this rock. Now, now uh, El Capitan is uh, 7,500 feet straight up, okay? Now, most people climb, who climb this, they climb it with a rope and some people that help them, right? Not Alex. Alex decided he was going to climb up this thing with some chalk and no rope. Here's a picture of when he did it. I can't even look at that because I don't know if, about you, if you're with me on this, but I, I'm afraid of heights. I, I, it's like I look at that photo and I, again, my hands, my hands start sweating. I can't even, I cannot handle it. He's 20. In this picture, he's 2,500 feet in the air. Again, no rope. My point is that we want what we should not want. 31 people have fallen and died trying to climb this rock face. You know, Alex made it to the top, he got lucky, and he became famous because he did that. They made the Netflix episode. In the documentary, when they were talking uh, about how risky this was and how crazy this was and how maybe he shouldn't do this sort of stuff, they were talking with his girlfriend at that time, they were, they were dating, and uh, she was expressing like, hey, I'm involved in your life and you're taking your life and, and, and you know, you're risking your life and that would mean that if you died, my heart would be broken. And, 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 and he said to her, to, this is the cost of being in a relationship with me. I feel no obligation to you. That's what he said in the documentary. That's what happens when you have desires that are kind of, uh, you know, off. <laughs> you, you end up living a very selfish life. You end up making crazy choices. 31 people died climbing this, this rock face. We want what we should not want. Something has gone terribly wrong with our desires. Do you agree? Do you agree? I mean, it's just, I mean, I know most of us don't want to climb a 7,500 foot rock face without a rope. I get that. But we want to do other stuff that doesn't make sense. We want to do other stuff that's entirely selfish, right? Listen to how Paul described the struggle in his own heart in Romans chapter 7. Listen, he says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Did you know that in this country, 10 million Americans suffer from domestic violence. One spouse hitting the other spouse. Now, I personally have never met a husband or a wife that says, you know what I do when I wake up in the morning? I make plans to beat the crap out of my wife. You know, like a left and a right. It's a good day. But yet, one out of four women in the United States of America suffer from physical or sexual abuse from their husband. The state of Indiana ranks fifth in domestic violence, men against women. Fifth, like we're like at the top. Now, I do know men that say, man, I, I want to love my wife. I want to cherish my wife. I want to honor my wife. And then when I hit her, when I abuse her, I hate myself. I do know those men. They want to do it right, but they end up doing what they say with me. They hate, well, what's going on inside of us? Our desires have gone wrong. We want to do what's right. We don't. Instead, we do what we hate. Look at verse 19. Paul says this, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do what, I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Oh, it's tough to be human, and don't you agree? Our desires, man, they're, they're, they're all over the place. Our wanter is broken. I don't know a, a man out there that says, you know what I want to do? I want to wake up in the morning and, and I want to get so drunk that, you know, I, I lose my job. I, I, I abuse my wife and my kids and, 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 and everyone just runs out and I get a divorce and I'm all alone. I don't know one person that says that's what I want to do with my life. Totally wreck it with alcohol. But yet that is what many people do. We end up doing the very thing that we hate to do with drugs or alcohol or, or some other behavior. 
that we know is wrong inside of us, but we do it anyway. Peter described the situation like this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's kind of issuing a challenge. He says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. In other words, this earth is not your home. You're just passing through 65, 75, 85 years. Some of you get 90, 95, but even that's a short period of time. Your home is in heaven. He says, as temporary residents and foreigners, keep away from worldly desires that what? That what? Say it with me. Wage war. There's like a civil war going on inside of us. These desires, they wage war against your very soul. This is kind of confusing because Peter's saying, I want you to run away from these desires that wage war in your soul. But who has those desires? I do. How am I supposed to run away from myself? I mean, if I go over here, there I am. And if I go over here, there I am. It's like run away or get away from, what if, what if the desires that are wrong are inside my chest? James, the apostle wrote it like this, that we are all tempted when we are drawn away and lured by our own desires. Listen, no one would sin or fall into temptation if they didn't want to. The desire is in here. So somehow we got to fight the battle internally. It's not about going to the beach or going to the mountains so you can get away from the worldly desires. No, the worldly desires are right here in my chest and they're right in your chest as well. So I'm gonna give you a little game plan, kind of help you to work through some desires that are wrong, that will ruin your life. A little game plan to fix those desires. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay, this is just my little plan. You can, if you've got a different one, you run yours. This is the one that I run. Number one, if you wanna fix your desires, you have to get rid of shame. You must get rid of shame. What am I talking about? Well, everything goes back to Genesis chapter one, two, and three. If you notice, I always go back to that when I'm preaching because Genesis one, two, and three kind of explain how this whole thing got started. <laughs> Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve, they blow it, they sin. And one of the first emotions, other than physical attraction to Eve, because that was probably Adam's first really exciting emotion because she showed up naked, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, there ain't no other animals like her. She's the only one that look like that. <laughs> and that's a good thing. After he kind of gets over that emotion, um, he has this other emotion after they blow it and they sin. You say, what emotion is that? Watch this. Genesis chapter three. At that moment, after they disobeyed God, they ate the fruit they shouldn't eat. Their eyes were open and they suddenly felt, say it with me, shame. shame. There it is. What is Shame. You know what it is because you felt it. It's that feeling inside of you that's like, I'm embarrassed. I shouldn't have done this. How could I do this? I just want to cover up. I want to crawl under a bed. I want to step into a closet. I want to hide. You know it because you felt it. And so have I many, many times. Adam feels shame at their nakedness. So what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and they covered themselves up. You know how we do that today with our shame? We succeed at work. We achieve in the classroom. We marry an attractive spouse. We buy a very expensive home or car. And you know what those things are? They're not wrong, they're not sinful. They're just fig leaves that make us look good on the outside. But meanwhile, many of us are hiding behind the success and the mask because we're filled with shame. That, that's what it's like to be human. That's what it's like when you fulfill, when you act on a desire that you know is wrong and, and now you're guilty and what do you do with that guilt? You, you, you sew together some fig leaves to cover up. Verse eight says this, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden of Eden. So what did they do? They, say it with me, they they hid. That's what you do when you're filled with shame. You go hide behind some trees. You cover up with some leaves and then you hide as if they were hiding from God. <laughs> I find that comical. There's no one on this planet that can hide from God. He sees everyone everywhere all the time. But that's what shame does to us. You know, our world has a solution for shame. It really does outside of the church. Let's just, the average, you know, community society, they have a, they have a solution to shame. 
because they know it's wrong and, or, or not that it's wrong. It just doesn't feel good. And we kind of have to have a solution to shame. So you know what they do? Our society tells us you should not feel ashamed of your behavior. You had those desires. You acted on those desires. You do you. Have you heard this? Yeah. It's a very popular statement. Stand up. You, that's, that's who you are. You want to do that? Good for you. Be proud. In fact, we have a whole month now called Pride Month. Uh, Come on. What do we do with feelings of feeling? Should I behave this way? Should I not behave this way? I have these desires. The Bible says they're wrong. The Bible clearly says in four or five very specific passages that there are certain desires, same-sex attractions, that are wrong. So now I feel shameful. So what do we do? Stand up. Be proud. That's how you get rid of shame. And the whole world's like, yeah, I guess, maybe. Even Christians, maybe, yeah, I mean, isn't, I mean love is accepting. And let me ask you a question. If you had an uncle who was drinking himself to death, bottle after bottle after bottle, what does love look like, that, like in that scenario? Does it look like you go to your uncle and say, Uncle, Uncle Johnny? I don't know why it's always Uncle Johnny. <laughs> I, just, I just want you to know, I embrace the vodka in your life. I accept it because I love you. Keep drinking. Bottle after bottle. Because that's what family does. Family accepts everything. That is not love, folks. But that's our world's solution to shame. We don't know what to do with shame, so we just say, hey, just, just you do you, and we'll accept everything, and, and, and no desire is wrong. And what happens when an older man desires a 12-year-old boy? What do we do then? Uh-oh. Now we're going to have to maybe say some things are wrong. That's a wrong desire, right? Or maybe, or maybe our culture is moving towards, well, that's just kind of like a new thing. We have to accept it. And that is where we are moving, folks, in that direction. No, 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 no. The solution to shame is not acceptance. The solution to shame is grace. Yes. Amen. That's what the solution is. Amen. We just got done singing a song. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed me white as snow. Wow. You see, that's what we do with shame. Adam and Eve blew it. And they, they felt that shame. So they sewed fig leaves together and they went to hide behind the bush because they knew they didn't want to be in God's presence. So God said, don't do that. What's the solution to that shame? It is the Savior. Yes. It is Jesus Christ who came to die for that sin, to cover that sin, to forgive that sin. And, and, and this is the beautiful thing about grace. Once you receive the forgiveness, and I know not all of us have done that, but once you receive the forgiveness of Jesus and he covers you from your sin and he washes you white as snow. Now you can step out from behind the bush and say, yes, it's me, oh Lord. It's me, oh Lord, standing in a need of prayer and, and, and you've forgiven me. And now I can begin, become honest. Some people say, Pastor Danny, why are you so honest about all of your failures? Not all of them, but a lot of them. In front of the whole church, you tell people how bad you screw things up. One word, grace. Yes. I came out from behind the bush and said, look, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like an actual idiot. I really am. Like I mess things up. I lose my temper. I throw things sometimes. One time, because I had the wrong desire for my son to become better than me at basketball. Anybody feel that? Yeah. He was like 13, maybe. I'm in the stands at a basketball game, and I wanted him to be successful so bad. And I wanted him to get a college scholarship. And I wanted him to do better than me. All sounds real good fatherly stuff, right? Until he started screwing up on the court. And I started yelling at him. And there was only probably 20 people in the gym that day. And I just started getting into him, yelling from the stands. I was so angry at his performance. He wasn't shooting when he was supposed to shoot. He wasn't hustling when he was supposed to hustle. He wasn't doing, he wasn't. And I was just, and I'm, my wife's sitting there. She's so embarrassed because the whole gymnasium is with my voice. It got so bad 
that Andrew, my son, started to hyperventilate on the court because of, I was yelling at him from the stands. And he started crying. It was perhaps my worst dad moment of my life. All unresolved desires, desiring things I shouldn't. And, and, and we're talking about a kid who, who's waking up reading his Bible every day, serving back in the children's ministry on Sunday morning. Joyful, happy kid. And here's his dad on the sidelines. Come on. Shoot. How, how is it that I could talk to you guys like this about, about how bad I really am? Grace. 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 Yes. Grace. So now you can come out and admit, admit, admit to it and actually get the help that you need. Because now you can be honest. And stop hiding. You know, most pastors will just hide behind this wall of like, well, I'm the pastor. I really don't mess up. Hogwash. They are full of crap. It is not true. It is not true. Okay, man, that's like a whole sermon for a whole nother day. But, 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 but I had to, let, let's get off that. That's the first, but that's the first part of fixing your emotions is, is receiving grace so you can step out and be honest. And then when you get honest, now we can start talking about how wrong the desires are. Let's, t- let's talk about number two. You must develop self-control. You know, the Bible talks a lot about self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is controlling those desires, telling yourself no. You don't hear that a lot in our culture today. You don't hear anybody say, hey, you know what we need to do today? Tell you no. You don't hear that a lot. But the Bible says self-control is absolutely essential. In fact, Proverbs chapter 25 says a person without self-control is like a city broken down without walls. What does that mean? Well, in ancient Israel, the last line of defense for a city was the wall around the city, this concrete wall 10, 12 feet high. If the city didn't have a wall, the enemy can come in and just take the city. That is self-control in your life. When you don't have self-control, any desire can come on in, creep inside of you, whether that's a desire for, to steal something, uh, to, to have sex with somebody you shouldn't have sex with, to look at pornography, to do something wrong, to steal from the company. If you don't have self-control, it's like, well, I feel it, I'm gonna act on it. And by the way, that's how addictions are formed, right? You feel it, you act on it, 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 before you know it, you have an addiction. But it starts out with saying yes to a wrong desire. You with me? So we need self-control. How do you develop self-control? Two ways. Number one, feed the spirit. Feed the spirit. I didn't say feed your spirit. I said feed feed the spirit. See, when when you place your faith in Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. In fact, Paul says that you are the temple now of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't feed spirit, capital S, your the spirit which by the way, your spirit is mingled with the spirit in the same way that a tea bag, when, when mixed with hot water, produces something different than the tea bag or the water. So you are the product, your spirit and the Holy Spirit come together and there's a byproduct and I'm talking about that spirit. If you don't feed that spirit and strengthen that spirit, you will not be able to control your desires. When I first became a Christian, I had all kinds of unruly desires because I grew up in New York City and I just, 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 just like, just not, not a good space for a high school student. And so I had, when I got saved and went to Liberty, I had all these desires I had to learn to control, say no to. One of the issues I had was the music I was listening to. Anybody ever hear, remember uh, the Wu-Tang Clan? <laughs> That's these guys right here. Uh, now, what's interesting about the Wu-Tang Clan is that they, uh, they grew up or lived on Staten Island. That's where I grew up and lived, right? So they actually had a store uh, close to the ferry there. and uh, the, It was called Woo Wear. <laughs> you could buy hats, hoodies, and other things. I never did buy anything from the store, but I, but, uh, I had friends who, who did. Anyway, I listened to the Wu-Tang Clan. Let's just say that their music did not feed the spirit. Okay, I am not going to encourage you to go download their music this afternoon. It will not feed the spirit. So when I got saved, I had to start, I had to stop, stop feeding the flesh. I had to start to feed the spirit. Well, what does that look like? It looked like these guys right here. Remember these guys? Anybody remember, remember, remember them from like 1997? No, this is DC talk. Remember this, you know who this guy is? Who's this guy right here? Toby Beck right there. Look how young he was. <laughs> 
They went to Liberty University a little bit ahead of Jackie and I, and so they were a big deal. Well, their lyrics and their music, they were, it was edifying to the spirit. It helped, it, wanted, it helped me to love God more and I wanted more of God. And so I started listening to different music. I also started reading the scriptures more, reading books. I also got around uh, three guys on my hall. I, I went down the list and I said, who are the three most godly guys? It was Jay Thompson, John Humphreys, and Ernie Banks. And I said to each one of those guys, you guys are gonna be my friends because you become like the people you run with. And so I started feeding my spirit with the right people, the right books, scripture, and the right music. Well, before you know it, some of those old desires started to go away and I started to develop new desires. Here's how the apostle Paul explained it in Galatians chapter six, for the one who sows to his own flesh, I had done enough of that in high school, the sinful nature. I had sowed into it, planted seeds into it. Well, from that same flesh reap corruption, had enough of that. Anybody have had, have you had enough of corruption yet? Broken relationships, guilt, shame, loss of a job, an addiction. You'll reap corruption if you sow to the flesh, but the one who sows to the capital S spirit, Holy Spirit, that person will reap eternal life. So I just started doing that way back when, back when I was back at Liberty. Sow into the spirit, sow into the spirit, sow into the spirit and reaping eternal life. That's how you develop self-control. Then number two, the second way you do it is you practice fasting. Fasting, that's not talked about. We're talking about a lot of things today people normally don't talk about. Fasting, what is fasting? Fasting is denying yourself food for a specific period of time for a spiritual purpose. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter six that we should fast. But when you fast, Jesus said, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you're fasting. It's not supposed to be something we post on Facebook (laughs) and tell people about. Except the only person who's going to know about it is your father who knows what you do in private. This is a private affair. And your father who sees everything in private will, say it with me, reward you. Now, what reward is that? Well, it depends on the spiritual purpose of the fast. If you're praying for a new job or a spouse or someone to be healed or something like that, then that's, that may be the reward. You know what, the, you know what another possibility is for the reward? Self-control. You say, how do you... How do you figure? Well, think about what a fast is. A fast is saying no to your stomach. That's what it is. And the stomach has a way of telling you that it wants something, doesn't it? I mean, there is no more powerful desire on this planet than what comes out of this space right here. Do you agree? Not even sexual desire. I don't even think it compares to to what this stomach will do to a person. How much control this stomach wants. So when you fast, you're saying, shut up and sit down. When you fast, you're learning to put your spirit in control of your bodily desires. Wow, there's an insight. Maybe the reward for fasting is self-control. Maybe by learning to control your appetite, you also learn to control your lust or your tendency to lie or exaggerate or your tendency to be physically or verbally abusive to other other people. There is an insight. Practice fasting. How many of you have ever seen the Society of Snow? It was a Netflix documentary that came out, kind of a movie thing last year, Society of Snow fascinating movie. It's about a a rugby team that's flying over the Andes mountains to get to this rugby tournament and they crash in the mountains. It's snow capped. It's sub 30 degree weather. Uh, They're by themselves. 12 people die on impact. Many survive, but there's no food. There's no food. There's no wildlife. It's all snow. It's all freezing. There's avalanches and they survive for 72 days until they are rescued. 72 days without food. How did they survive? You tell me. They ate each other. That is how strong the stomach is. The only way to get out of that valley was to eat their dead friends. It's called cannibalism. You say, how powerful is the stomach? Ooh, it'll make you do some stuff to avoid dying. You talk about the power of fasting. You say no to this stomach, you will put your spirit in charge of your desires and then you'll be able to say no to all of the other desires that are wrong in your life. Self Control. Feed the spirit, practice fasting. Let me, get, let me get quickly into this last one. You want to help yourself? You want to fix your desires? Get rid of the temptation. 
Come on, listen to me. Help yourself out. If you struggle with Chips Ahoy cookies, <laughs> then go into the cupboard or the whatever that thing is, the closet. What do you call it? The pantry. I can't ever remember that word. <laughs> go into the pantry and get the stupid chocolate chip cookies out and throw them in the trash. Help yourself. Remove the temptation. Get rid, like eliminate it. You say, does the Bible teach that? You bet it does. I love the Bible. It teaches this stuff. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 13. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ like you'd put on a shirt. Like be as close to Jesus as your shirt is to your body. That's pretty close. You agree? Another, no, John the apostle said, abide in Christ. Like a, like a branch abides into the vine. Like stay as tight with Jesus as you possibly could. And as you're doing that, watch this. Make no provision for the sinful nature, for the flesh, to gratify it. Say it with me. It's what? Yeah. See, the battle is in here. It's not out there. It's not his fault, her fault. It's not the news. It's not the media. It's right in here. Temptation is only a problem because I have wrong desires. So Paul says, don't even give your sinful, nation, your sinful nature, your flesh, don't even give it an opportunity to satisfy its desires. What does that mean? Well... It means if you have a problem with alcohol, get all of the alcohol out of your house. And when your friends are saying, hey, it's Friday night, we're after work, we're gonna go get some drinks at such and such place, I'm not going. Why? Because I can't just have one, I always have to have six. And then I'm drunk. Help yourself and make no provision. So what are my friends gonna say? Well, who cares? Would you rather be a drunk and ruin your life or have the the approval of your friends. Come on, we gotta grow up here. Make no provision for your flesh means do not even give your sinful nature an opportunity to sin. You say, what else does that look like? Well, if you have a problem with pornography and you can't stop looking on it at your phone, then you're not mature enough to have a smartphone. Here's an idea, get rid of it. Oh, Pastor Danny. Isn't he so out to lunch? Like, he has no clue. Like, I need this for work. I need this for my Instagram and blah, blah, blah. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Real? Okay. Hey, keep it for your Instagram. By all means, keep it for work. And you'll continue to have a porn problem. Is that, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Like, you say, well, that's really, really radical. What am I supposed to do? How about this? Get a flip phone. They still have them for people like you. Because you can't say no. The porn comes up, you can't help yourself. Before you know, you're an hour, two hours in watching porn on your phone. Here's what Jesus said when it comes to sexual purity and immorality and pornography. He said, if your right eye caused you to sin, uh, take a knife and pop that sucker out. That's what he said. Tear it out, throw it away. Now that's radical. I'm just talking about getting rid of a phone. Jesus is talking about you losing an eye, okay? I'm like backing things down a bit. He says, why? For it's better for you to lose a, one of your members than for you to take your whole body and have it thrown into, and then he brings up hell. It's like, why, 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 why would you bring up hell in a conversation about sexual purity? Here's why. Because when a person makes their desires number one in their life, that is the path to hell on earth and hell in the, in the afterlife. You say, are you saying if I sin sexually, I'm going to hell? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if that's the path of your life, if that's what you do, you live by your desires. They are number one. When you feel it, you do it. When you're hungry, you eat it. When you want to watch, you watch. When you want to stay in bed, you stay in bed. When you don't want to go to work, you don't want to go to work. When you don't want to make the hard decision, you don't make the... When your desires rule your life, that will lead to hell on earth and hell in the afterlife. This is serious business, Jesus is saying. So what is he really saying when it comes to your, your desires? He's saying, do whatever it takes. Be as right, get rid of that phone, get rid of the alcohol, get, don't go to those places, make no provision for the flesh, do whatever it takes to stop sinning. That's what Jesus is saying. This last week, we've had two mega, two mega pastors resign from their churches. Churches double the size of our church. 
These are pastors with, with national platforms. And both of them had to resign because of unruly desires. This isn't your everyday businessman who happens to be a Christian. These are spiritual leaders in our country. Why? Because they were unable to control whatever desire came up inside of them. And then they acted upon it. And they disqualified themselves. These are good, godly men but they did not control their desires. What am I saying today? Well, there's a civil war going on inside of you. And if you don't take action, embrace grace, develop self-control, and do whatever it takes to make no provision for the flesh, your desires are gonna get the better part of you. Now, I got some bonus for material for you today, okay? Yeah, I normally don't do this, but would you guys like some bonus material? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to go back to something Dallas Willard said earlier. He said, we have to learn to not want what we currently want, and we have to learn to want what we currently don't want. Remember that? Yeah. It's kind of like, oh gosh, that's right. I get that. How do you do that? How do you learn to want what God wants you to want? I've been thinking about that for a long time. And I think I found the answer in Psalm 37, verse 4. Listen to this. Listen to what King David writes. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. Yes. Key word, delight. I know what delight means because I delight in, there's this pizzeria in New York City called, uh, um, 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 it's slipping my mind. It's a really good pizzeria. <laughs> it's called Danino's. I went there as a kid. They, they dish out this pepperoni pizza that is just, just insane. And my dad would always say, hey, after the game, Saturday, we're going to Danino's. I was more excited about the pizza than the baseball. I know what it means to delight. It means to find joy in. Here's what David says. Delight yourself in the Lord, and then he's going to do something. He'll give you, and there's that word. He'll give you what? He'll give you the, Desire. the desires of your heart. Which at first glance, this is like, well, well, that sounds like a good deal. Like if I delight in the Lord, then the Lord will give me the desires of my heart. And I desire a Corvette. So this is pretty good. <laughs> I desire a raise at work. I desire to make 150 grand a year. I desire this. I, this is a good deal. Show me how to delight in the Lord. This sounds like a great promise. That's not what this says. Over years and years and years of trying to figure out what this says, here, here, here's, what I, here's what I've come to. And this is, again, this answers the question, how do you learn to want what God, should want, God wants you to want? When you delight yourself in the Lord and you truly, sincerely look to him for your happiness, something happens to your desires. Your desires change. And then God delights to give you the desire of your heart because you, you start desiring what he wants you to desire. Let me give you an example. There was a time in my life where I did not desire my life to bring a smile to God's face. Just didn't care. I was unconcerned about his opinion. Fast forward many years of delighting in him and, and now there's this strong desire, and it needs to be stronger. Don't get me wrong. We're all in a work in progress. But there's this strong desire at the end of the day to look up and say, did my life make you smile? The way I talked to Jackie, the way I handled this situation at work, the way I did this. I want you to look down and say, that's my boy. That's my guy. Look, he did it the way we would do it. Jesus, here, look. He said it the way you would say it. He treated that person the way that you would have treated them. I want that. I've never, I never wanted that many, many years ago. But what happened? I delighted myself in the Lord. He started giving me these other desires. And now he's giving me the desires of my heart. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Now, that's just a little bonus material. You can take Psalm 37, verse 4. If we can pop it back up there, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you. Take that. You do a little experiment. Take a, do, do a, do a one-year experiment to see if that works for you. I guarantee it will. He will change your desires. Now, as we wrap up real quick, a few
few moments ago, I said the only path that solves the problem of shame is grace. What is grace? Well, let's look at Romans chapter five, verse eight, because I think the apostle Paul explained it well. He says, but God showing his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. And then I love this word. The next word, while. God showed us how much he loved us by sending Jesus to die while, during, in the middle of us sinning. See, it's not like God looked down upon earth and is like, man, they, they, these guys are doing pretty good. Let's help them out. Look, they're making improvements. Let's, let's go down and we'll, we'll assist them. It's not like that. Like grace is when God looked down and said, oh boy, what a mess. They, they, they're screwing this up. He's screwing this up. She's screwing this up. Let, and, and they're disobeying and, and they're deceiving and being passive aggressive, physically aggressive. And, and they're doing all these things in the middle of our, our violence and, and our, all of our wrong desires. God says, in the middle of that mess, Jesus, I want you to go. While they were sinning, in the middle of their sin, while they were totally and completely undeserving, Christ died for you. Does that make sense? That, that is grace. Grace is not God sitting around waiting for you to kind of get yourself together. And then when you make some good improvements, then he tries to assist you. That's not grace. Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And at just the right time, the Bible says God reached down and he, he, he picked you up because of his love. He wants to invite you into that grace today. A few moments ago, we sang, we sang this song. Sin has left its crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. That is grace. And maybe today, maybe today, whatever campus you're watching, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're present here at Stones Crossing, you've never embraced grace before. And right, right now, you need to come out from behind that tree and take off those fig leaves and say, God, here I am. I have blown it and I am receiving your forgiveness today. Christ died for you while you were a sinner. If you'd like to step into grace today, I'm gonna say a simple prayer. Take these words, turn them into your own, express faith to God. Say this to him right now. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for grace. I don't deserve it. But in the middle of my mess, you reach down in love, in grace, and you died for me. Paid the price for my sin. So I ask you to forgive me today. Wash me. Make me as white as snow. I receive your grace today. Make me your child by faith as I trust you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer at any one of our locations, we wanna celebrate, amen, all of our campuses, amen. If you did that, we would love to put a Bible in your hands inside this box. There's a copy of the New Testament and some information along with uh, a gift uh, to, to present to you today. So if you put your faith in Christ today, text the word SAVED to 65248. You can grab one of these in the lobby at your campus. If you're watching online, give us a little bit more info and we'll send one to you in the mail. One more time, church, can we give God glory, amen? I hope this series was a blessing to you. I'm gonna pray really quick and then we'll dismiss to the local teams. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much that you've given us incredible wisdom from the scriptures on how to fix stuff when, they, when it breaks. Whether that's a money issue or a marriage issue or a relationship issue or a parenting issue, or even with our attitude, like today we talked about our desires. You've not left us in the dark. You've shown us a way out. Give us the wisdom to discover that, those paths, and to take those paths that we might experience the life that you created us to live. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, right? I'm gonna hand things off to the local teams.